Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be very, very proud to present tonight, me. Bruce Forsyth is one of the great British entertainers. Nice to see you, to see you. <laughs> In a versatile career spanning over 70 years, he's been the supreme showman. Armed with an arsenal of catchphrases. What a point, mate! He became the undisputed king of Saturday Night TV. Thank you very much. A regular guest on chat shows, his hilarious interview appearances displayed trademark wit and comedy timing. I play the electric piano like Collins. Bill Collins. Bro. No, Joe Collins. <laughs> but he also revealed the downside of being such a sought-after showman. My family life was, was almost nil at times. And his acrimonious relationship with the press. News of the World are doing a, a series on my sex life. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the wanted ads, it's that big. <laughs> when I go on a show, uh, a lot of people call me Forsyth. You see, if it's an ordinary, run-of-the-mill kind of show, I... Yes, I'm called Forsyth. But if the show has a little bit more class about the whole thing, then I in insist on being called Forsyth. <laughs> <laughs> it's got more of a Forsyth. Well, really? so, yeah, it's got something better. What do you want us to call you on this show? Higgins. <laughs> Born in 1928, Bruce was raised in North London. Born in Victoria, Victoria Road, Edmonton. That's right. We're not in the road. No. But, uh... <laughs> you started life as Bruce Forsyth Johnson. No, actually, my, my, my real sir, uh, my whole name was Bruce Joseph Forsyth Johnson. Hmm. Yes. What happened to Johnson? Well, same thing happened to Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> Growing up in suburbia, Bruce took an interest in show business from a very early age. I always had this admiration for Fred Astaire whenever I went to see uh, his films and any musical films I would love, you know. And uh, so I had quite an interest in dancing. Because my father, had, he, he had a garage in Edmonton, you see, and he had 32 lock-up garages and he had all these roofs, you see, and they really did make a, a noise. So I would go and see Fred Astaire do this marvellous routine, dancing on roofs and right, and I would get up there and dance on all the roofs and then the raids would come and all the garages would leak. <laughs> parents encouraged me to, to, to go ahead with this dancing bit, although I used to play a lot of football when I was a kid, you know, they said to me, would you like to go to dancing lessons? So I said yes, so they phoned up the local teacher, and I used to go every Friday night with my dancing shoes and, uh, and, and learn this part of the business. Was it thought as, of, of being a bit sissy in the area that you Oh, yes, yes, I mean, uh, if you were, a, you know, if, if anybody found out you were taking dancing lessons, that was definitely, oh, he's a bit... Uh... <laughs> Definitely a bit like that, you see, um, which was a bit embarrassing. I mean, I got into a fight once because the fellow saw me, you know, going along and he knocked the case out of my hand and he started making a few remarks and I finished up having a, a real good old fight with him. Because yes. I was quite strong, I was quite a wiry little spider. Yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, Bruce didn't let the mickey-taking affect him and continued to pursue his love of dance. And I started going in for these competitions uh, what was also embarrassing, I used to change into my little satin sequin suits. Oh, you know? <laughs> oh what you've missed. <laughs> and uh, I'd, I'd have to change into those there again. I'd have to go in the corner because, you see, I'd be the only boy dancer there. All the rest would be all these little girls. I was, I was petrified of them, really, you know, because they grabbed hold of me or something, you know. And... <laughs> At the age of 11, Bruce made his first foray in front of the camera at the BBC studios in Alexandra Palace. Sadly, the footage no longer exists. It was Jasmine Bly. Anybody old enough to remember Jasmine Bly? <laughs> oh, I feel so old. Right. say yes. <laughs> and you could go along and she'd interview you. And then she then she said, "Well, that's been nice to talk to you. Now, if you want to get up and do your song and yeah. dance, which I did, and her, her final question is, well, what do you want to be, Bruce? What, what is your aim?" I said, "Well, I want to be a star and buy my mum a fur coat." Oh, 
if a woman had a fur coat, that was it. She was, well, she was either one thing or the other. <laughs> <laughs> now, you left school at 14. Yes. My headmaster said, I can't give you a very good report because you've, you've had so little schooling. I said, don't worry, sir. I said, I'm going into a business where they go by what they see you can do, not by what you've done. So he said, what business is that? I said, show business, sir. And he went, well, Lord help you. And that was it. No. You have to go in at the age of 14. Yes, How can you get it. a job at 14? Yes, well, I put an advert in the stage. <laughs> <laughs> Which is our sort of show business newspaper, and I put an ever and I used to call myself Boy Bruce then. <laughs> Boy Bruce, the mighty atom. <laughs> <laughs> you exploded all over the state. And I got a reply, and I got a job for five <coughs> quid, and five I worked quid. Bilston, the <laughs> theatre in Bilston. If you're looking in Bilston, the black country. Yes, and I got 13 and fourpence, because they had a share out. We didn't take much money that week. <laughs> <laughs> With the country at war, some of Bruce's early engagements weren't exactly smooth-running, glamorous affairs. I play piano in this, in this very theatre when it was the Shepherd's Bush, Bush Empire. Empire yeah. I was playing piano here when the flying bombs were coming over. That's... And one night, this is absolutely true, this I is not happy that. news, I was playing the piano here for a little girl who was singing in the middle of the stage, Leonard Harris Discoveries. The flying bombs stopped, the engine stopped, and then nothing. The whole audience got under the seats. I got under the piano, got the girl under the piano as well, for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. And then we heard about 30 seconds afterwards a terrific crash when the bomb actually landed. After the war, Bruce had a short stint as a dancer at London's Windmill Theatre. He would later return as a solo act to face an audition with a notoriously hard-to-impress manager, Vivian Van Damme. And I did another audition, this time as a single performer, where I was doing all the things that I did when I did my first audition for him. And uh, at the end of this, I did this one on the stage, and he came up to me and asked me, he says, yes, Bruce, definitely. So I said, oh, yes. He said, yes, definitely. I thought, oh, crikey, good. I've definitely got the job. He said, you definitely need funny material. It was at the windmill that you fell in love with the woman who was to become your first wife, Penny. Yes, yes. Tell, tell me about that time. They gave me the job of uh, choreographing the tap-dancing duets, and uh, Penny was one of the girls that I used to teach to dance. And at what stage did you realise this was the woman you were going to marry? Well, it was, it was strange, really, because we got this job going to India, and um, the agent who booked us... Just before we, we left, he said, you know, he said, you could have much better accommodation on the ship if you were married. We both thought the same thing. Well, yes, why not? And our honeymoon can be going through the Mediterranean and through Egypt and, and all so that. So you basically got married to get a better suite, Bruce? Yes, well, I suppose. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> the Forsyths began to raise a family together but Bruce would soon have to juggle his commitments as a father with one of the biggest jobs in entertainment. In the mid-1950s, Bruce Forsyth was forging a career as an entertainer, playing to variety theatres all over the country. But he was far from top billing. I was at the theatre in Cleethorpes. I think it was the Empire Cleethorpes. I don't know me being who I was. I knew I'd either be on the third floor, the fourth floor, or the fifth floor, because I was always second bottom of the bill. So I looked there, where was the Oh, yeah, Duncan. Oh, in, in the basement. Well, that's new, in the basement. Uh, Bruce Forsyth and Duncan's Collies. <laughs> I'm, only, I'm only bloody dressing with a dog act. <laughs> I couldn't believe this. Do you ever feel like giving it up? Being a young performer, you'd work on the bill with a lot of the old performers, and a lot of the old performers would tend to look down on you, especially if they hadn't made it. Mm. If, if you, you could even smell the sour grapes. You didn't have to taste them. You could smell them, you see. And I, I wanted to, if I didn't make it, get out. Mm. Maybe go more into the musical side of, uh, of the business or, or something else. But I didn't want to be a frustrated pro. Bruce's determination began to pay off in 1958 when he landed the prestigious role of host on Sunday night at the London Palladium. A hugely popular variety series beamed live to the nation, featuring performances from top acts of the period. 
Oh, well, the big brave, it was definitely the Palladium. I'd been in show business about 16, 17 years by then, and I'd been in reviews, I'd, I'd played in variety, I'd done different things of, of this sort. Um, but getting the break at the Palladium was the big, uh, the big deal. A relation of mine was at the, at the Hippodrome in Eastbourne, in the audience, some years ago, when you announced from the stage that you had that job at the oh, London really? Palladium. really? Yes. Really? And, uh, the old Hippodrome. That's it. The old Hippodrome in Eastbourne. But that, so that was a really a plum job to get. You must have been very thrilled. The Hippodrome Eastbourne, oh. wasn't it? <laughs> 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 no, it's been done up now. I mean, they put a roof on it. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> sometimes we get 25, 30 people there and that would be it. And I go from that on a Friday and Saturday, drive up to London and then be in the Palladium with two and a half thousand people. The contrast was incredible. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Sunday night at the London Palladium. Despite his experience on the boards, the Palladium was in a different league and Bruce felt the pressure. The first time I ever went there, for the first show I ever did, I got to the stage door and I thought, I'm going to drive round the block again, and I did before I went in. I was very, very nervous. Uh, I think it's probably the most nervous I've ever been in my life. <laughs> Luckily for Bruce, his initial apprehension didn't hold him back and he became much more than just the compare, taking part in sketches like this with slapstick legend Norman Wisdom. <laughs> One of the most popular segments of the series was Beat the Clock, where Bruce guided members of the audience through a plethora of deceptively difficult games. 55 seconds in to beat the clock and the hold the skittles over, starting from now. Back again. Get him all ready. That's it. We'll have to give it a bigger belt than that and keep it on the ground, keep it on the island. What's the secret of that, of working with people? Because there is a danger, A, you patronise them, B, you're yes. too cruel with them. I mean, it's a tightrope that you, that you have to tread all the time. It is. Well, the first thing about audience participation is you've got to enjoy it. Come on, dear. Go round the other way, dear. I wish people wouldn't drink. Okay. I've always loved it. I've loved it because you never know what's going to happen. I love getting out of a situation. If somebody says something, I like to come back at them. Or if they do something, I love to pounce on it. You have won a weekend in Paris. <laughs> yes? Oh. Well, right. Lily. Wait until you get to Paris, dear. Control yourself. Right. <laughs> Beat the Clock showcased Bruce's skill with the public, a talent he'd honed during performances at a summer season on the South Coast in the mid-50s. Before I did Beat the Clock, uh, I was working in concert party, and in concert party on the Sundays, we had to do games because you weren't allowed to use uh, costumes or sets, you know, I mean, we're going back a long time now. So um, the producer of this concert party that I was in, a guy called Hedley Claxton, used to talk like that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, he said, I'll tell you we do these games, we do these games, you see, you know, he showed me all the games and all that. He said, now, we've got to be down by 10 o'clock because 10 o'clock, licensing hours and everything else, we've got to stop then, we have to stop then. So I said, all fine. So we did the show and uh, the first half went an hour and 40 minutes <laughs> because I had so much fun with the people and it was my first experience of audience participation. So he came round after and said, I don't know what we're going to do, we didn't know what we're going to do. <laughs> After hosting proceedings on and off for a six-year period, often attracting 20 million viewers, Bruce left Sunday night at the London Palladium in 1964. His next TV project would be his own star vehicle, the Bruce Forsyth Show, where he got to share the screen with some of the biggest names in the business, like Tommy Cooper. I'll just have, a, uh, just have a glass of milk. Have a glass of milk. All right, yeah. glass of milk. Hello? Uh, will you ring back? We're not on the phone yet. <laughs> <laughs> Give it to me. Oh, not on the phone. Hang on. Hello? <laughs> In the late 60s, Bruce graced the silver screen in Star alongside Julie Andrews and would later go on to appear in the Disney classic 
bed knobs and broomsticks. But his greatest challenge of the decade was West End musical Little Me, where he performed in seven different roles. Little Me was probably the best thing I'll ever do in my life. That's the, the kind of person I am. I hate to feel too safe and too secure. He'd now become a household name, but fame inevitably came at a price. Nowadays, you, you just can't walk up and down a street without being recognised and probably without being chased for autographs. How, how do you feel about this? Uh, no, you go through three stages with this. Um, the first stage is you think, oh, isn't it marvellous? That taxi driver knows me and the bus driver knows me and that lady with the shopping bag, she knows me. And, and you start to feel very elated about this. And this goes on for a while. And then, you, you, then the next stage is you think, oh, I'm not quite sure whether I like this or not. You can't go anywhere and you have to walk down the street very fast um, all the time. You have to cross the street very fast. Otherwise, somebody might want to hit you. <laughs> and um, so you, you go through that stage. And then the third stage you go through, you, you say, well, I've got to live with this. Uh, so you, you either accept it and, and enjoy it and uh, accept that way of going on or, 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 or it, life yeah. can become a, a bit of a misery, so yeah. you end up by accepting it. I've tried sometimes putting a funny hat on and glasses. Disguises, you know. have you? I once, yes, I once walked through, past uh, two women who were talking with a pram, you know, and I walked past them with my hat on and my glasses, you know, doing all that. And then one of them turned around and said, no, good, putting all that on, Bruce, we'd know you by your funny walk. <laughs> Bruce's popularity made him one of the most sought-after people in showbiz, but being in constant demand meant repercussions for his wife and three daughters. Hello, darling. What are you doing here? Where have you been all week? Well, I, I've, just, I've just finished the, the show with Norman. What kind of father were you in the, in the early days, do you think? Not much of a father, actually. Not much of a father in many ways, because... I could be rehearsing three shows at the same time. My family life was, was almost nil at times, so my, I call them my older group, my older group, Debbie, Julie and Laura. I didn't see as much of them as I would have liked to have done, and it stopped me being uh, the father that I would have liked to have been. <laughs> when you hit it big in our business, you're taken over by the business. And uh, it not only affects you, but it affects your partner. Um, success can change both people in a marriage. Just the fact that it happens to uh, the man, should we say. This doesn't mean to say it isn't going to affect the woman. Success is a, is a thing that uh, nobody knows, really, how they will, will react until it happens to them. Bruce and Penny's marriage broke down. But although his private life was strained, Bruce's colourful career went from strength to strength. In 1971, he became host of a brand new show. The Generation Game was based on a format from Holland, picked up by the BBC's head of light entertainment to cash in on TV's game show boom. And I want to play the game with you. When Bill Cotton asked me to do the show, he put this tape on, it's all in Dutch, of course, mm. couldn't understand mm. a word. And this woman came up in, the, in this black slinky dress and she spoke for about five minutes and then they did this game and then she went on again. And, said, and at the end of it, he said, well, what do you think, Bruce? I said, well, I'm not wearing the dress for a start. <laughs> on you come, then. The first one. Number one, top of the ratings, every week without fail. You don't have to look to see what's number one. We look for what's number two and number three. Nobody would have believed, actually, about seven years ago that at six o'clock on a Saturday night you can have a show that would get that kind of rating. It really has been a, a tremendous thing. A cuddly gorilla, an insulated jug, a wine-making kit, a cassette... Oh! Bruce's knack for having fun with and getting the most out of the contestants was the very heart of each Generation Game episode. Oh, Rocky, you're all right, you're all right. I don't, I don't think I am, but you're all right. The contestants knew that they would have to endure mocking quips from their quick-witted host. Couldn't we get a Fifi that could breathe? <laughs> but it wasn't just Generation Game participants who could be teased. Throughout his career, Bruce never missed an opportunity to poke fun at an audience. Is this the 
the crowd. This is what time's the seance. The booth that ladies with you, sir. Do you always carry a spear? You are a devil. May I say you've been my kind of audience, no taste. You really haven't. <laughs> Audiences, and when I go to clubs, they expect me to be a bit rude to them. If I'm not rude or seemingly rude to people, it's never the same me. They expect me to have a go at them. With the Generation Game in full swing in 1973, Bruce married his co-host, Anthea Redfern. I really don't know anybody who's, who, was, who was wooed, anybody as attractive as you, has been wooed oh. by doughnuts. Every day before rehearsals, and I mean, it's a very, very tight schedule when one's doing a show, as you know. Mm. He used to be late, like five and ten minutes. I used to think, well, if I can be here on time, why can't he? And eventually he used to come in with this great big bag, and I opened the bag, and there were like six jam donuts, which I'd stuff like mad. And this is very true, that's how he won my love. Yes. Oh. Secret lads, buy her a yes, donut. <laughs> Now happily married to Anthea, and with the Generation Game top of the ratings, it seemed like Bruce Forsyth could do no wrong. But things were about to turn sour. By the mid-1970s, Bruce Forsyth was one of the most famous faces in Britain. The name Brucey had become synonymous with high-octane, family-friendly entertainment. See that? Stay here. <laughs> Why is it, howsoever, that you have, or seem to have, more en energy than the rest of us put together? Well, it's mostly acting and pills. <laughs> <laughs> In that order. <laughs> In 1977, at the height of his popularity, Bruce dropped a bombshell, making the bold decision to quit his Saturday night ratings winner after being offered the lead in new musical, The Travelling Music Show. You've given up the generation game. You're putting your reputation on the line doing a West End musical. My reputation has been that? on the line for the last 20 years. So I don't think one is doing... One's doing an extension. Uh, you've always got your reputation. Do you think it was a mistake, though, giving up the Jenga? No, not for me, although it meant so much to me. It was, it was a bit of a heart tug to leave the show because it meant an awful lot. It did so much for me. But uh, it was certainly the right thing to do at the right time, and I don't regret it at all. In 1978, Bruce returned to our screens on ITV to front Bruce Forsyth's Big Night, a series of entertainment spectaculars where he would sing and dance... <laughs> Have a drink. <laughs> Interview. Yes. Are you all right, dear? Yes, darling. And perform with top celebrity guests. <laughs> and members of the public. Off you go. <laughs> but despite a huge promotional push, many felt it failed to live up to expectations. We had teething troubles for the first three or four weeks. They weren't as well, although I don't think any of the shows were bad shows. I mean, we didn't, I don't think we ever put out a show that was really bad. They weren't as we wanted them. What does your mum do? Change the subject quick. Yeah. <laughs> sells ice cream. She sells ice cream, does she really? Does she do it for the lolly? <laughs> <laughs> no, not really, I see. Where, where does she sell the ice cream? Over the phone. Over the phone? Yeah. That's a bit messy, isn't it? <laughs> well, well, if she sells a raspberry ripple, does she have to wait for the pips? <laughs> In television, you, you do a show, you don't have the advantage of going on tour for four weeks, like a, a West End musical or a West End play or anything else like that. You just have to get into a, a rehearsal room, then you go into the studio and you do it. OK, there were quite a few things wrong with the show. Um, and we did. We lost a lot of viewers. After his new series was panned in the press, Bruce took the extraordinary step of defending it while on air. With all that pre-press, it made people think that when the show started, that glitter was going to come out the set. And, you know, it was going to be so sensational. And it's like everything else. If, if people tell you, oh, you must go and see that, when you go and see it yourself, you're a bit disappointed. And I know when I'm working well, I know if I'm getting over to you 400 people here, you represent, at the moment, we're getting 13 and a half million viewers, which is a lot of people. I say good luck to the free press. Marvellous. But what about a free hit back? Why can't we as people 
And not, and, and uh, it's, I mean, this is marvellous for me. If they, if they put this out, I'll be thrilled. Because I think sometimes somebody had a go back. Bruce tried to put the Ferrari surrounding the big night behind him and sank all his energy into fulfilling his lifelong ambition to appear on Broadway. You are a huge star in England, then you come here and it's like breaking in a whole new audience. Yes, because a, a press guy got onto me yesterday and he, says, he said, you're, you're so big in England. He said, why don't, we, why don't we know about you? The only way a vaudeville performer or a variety performer can, can get, uh, to, to get to, for people to see them and maybe be able to open up another market here is to physically come over and do it. And that's exactly what he did. But even on the other side of the pond, Bruce couldn't escape the British media. Bruce Forsyth, have the Broadway butchers killed your prospects in America, as most of our newspapers have been claiming? Is that what they've done? Yes. <laughs> They're all, they never stop, do they? Well, no, no, it hasn't been complete butchery. I mean, I'm at a disadvantage because I don't know exactly what has been said. Um, but let me explain, Donald. In the Times and in the news, I did have two very bad ones. Now, the New York Post was uh, an absolute rave. It was uh, probably one of the best reviews I've ever had in my life. The other very important thing here is the Associated Press review. And that turned out to be a rave as well. So actually, in point of fact, Donald, I've broken even. And um, I told the British press that were here in New York, actually, on the, um, on, on the opening night. They said, but how do you think it's going to go press-wise? I said, look, if I break even, I'll be satisfied. Even though you say you've broken even, there are, yeah. <clears throat> there are lots of people in the, among the American critics who don't think so. Well, why, what has personally made you been so desperate to break into America and go on Broadway? I'm not desperate. It's an ambition. You see, if you're a performer, if you haven't got ambition, then you might as well pack it in. One of the critics who wasn't so friendly said that your show was performed with the maximum of vigour but the minimum of innovation. Is it, is it possible that your, your material wasn't new enough? Not a possible at all. I mean, I've had things like that said about me in England. It's a part of our job to be criticised. The awful thing is that when you do break even, as I have here, you know only one side of the story is being given again. It's the same old nonsense. In fact, I'm going to do a TV show in England one day. I'm going to call it What the Papers Didn't Say. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's been anybody in the last... Not that I know. I don't think anybody has taken the, uh, the stick I, I've had over the last three years. Not as a, as a pro. Mm. Um, but, you know, it, and I think what, what it does to you when, you, when you get so much of it, I think you either say, I think it either, you either say, oh, well, oh, I can't stand it anymore, and you have a nervous breakdown. Or you say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight this, and I'm, I'm going to have a go. And that's the way it affected me. By the end of the 1970s, Bruce and Anthea had separated. But this still didn't stop the press hounding them. Anthea's had more of a pasting than I have in the last couple of years. Anyway, she was in Miami and there's a big story going on. Then they found out I was in New York and a story went on that I was going to go to Miami to sort everything out. You know, we had been separated for a year and a half. The guy came to meet me and he said, there's about ten photographers, he said, they're all there. I said, oh dear. So now I know that they're now wanting from me a sad picture. See, Brucey comes back, you see, and then he's walking down the, yeah, thing, yeah, the yeah. corridor there, Drum. and they want a real sad picture. Yeah. So I thought, no, I'll, I'll just put on a great big grin, you see. So I just walked the corridor with this smile. Like the answer, <laughs> and I didn't rush like you normally do. If you're going to go, I don't like this. Then a, then a guy got here, a reporter here, another one there, you see. And they started firing questions, but I didn't answer them. Because, you see, if I answered a question and I went, straight away I've got a serious <laughs> face. <laughs> then they've got their eyes. So I kept on... <laughs> <laughs> You see, and then they went on talking and talking and talking. I was going, <laughs> and, then, and then it went on and on. I finally got to the door. I could go through, and then the reporter said, "Have you really lost your voice, Bruce?" I went. <laughs> <laughs> the now single Bruce was asked to judge the 1980 Miss World competition, but found his attention drawn towards fellow panelist and winner of the 1975 contest, Will Nalia Merced. She turned up with this red dress, with this mass of black hair and this... I thought, God, dear, oh, dear, God, <laughs> here I go again. 
<laughs> and I'd made up my mind I was never going to get married. The last thing I was going to do was get married. I was going to be, be Mr Frisky mm. for the rest of my life, <laughs> but I saw her and I just fell like a ton of bricks. Just over two years later, Miss World 75 had become Mrs Forsyth number three. People saw that I'm 53 and my wife was 23. <laughs> and, <laughs> and people often say, they still say to me now, they say, you know, uh, how do you, you have such a well, young wife? Uh, what happens? How does it work? Uh, uh, well, you see, she keeps up with me very well. <laughs> <laughs> For all his successes with beautiful women, in the early days, people had come to different conclusions about Bruce. Sunday, sweet Sunday, with nothing to do. Sunday, you were a hoofer. Hoofer, yes. A hoofer. Some people, I think, yeah. have thought you were a hoofer <laughs> over the years. Because if you don't mind me saying, Bruce, <laughs> you can air toward a, towards a mince. <laughs> Actually, when I first started at the Palladium, yes, uh, because of my walk, and I have got a, a bit of a funny, I know that. <laughs> For the first couple of years, people did think I, I was a homosexual. Who is it? Oh, Reds! Reds! And I think it was a way of getting to the women in the audience, to, to make friends with the women. If you said little remarks that women would say, I think it endeared you a bit to, to the women. And the men thought, you know, the great big whatever he was. But when my reputation caught up with me, they found out that wasn't true. Because you loved life, didn't you? I loved life and ladies. Yes. <laughs> Especially ladies. <laughs> While Bruce was enjoying his third marriage, he returned to familiar ground professionally. And through the 80s and 90s was at the helm of a string of game shows, including The Price is Right, You Bet, and play your cards right. All right, we asked 100 farmers, if the vet hurt his hand, would you be prepared to take a cow's temperature? <laughs> Where do you take a cow's temperature? <laughs> well, come round the back and I'll tell you. Again. What makes a good contestant? A good contestant, well, somebody who is maybe a little bit nervous, but then when they get on there, they manage to relax. Oh, I love the shirt. <laughs> Lovely. Did you make it yourself? <laughs> Half of my job at the start there is to relax them. And uh, by having a bit of fun with them and chatting with them and talking about their lives... What do you do, uh, Barry? Uh, I'm self-employed, shop lift fitter. <laughs> shop fitter. <laughs> We'll start again, I'll say back. <laughs> All we need now are our plans. <laughs> we never knew what the contestants were going to be like, which was always fun for me to pick on something that yeah. they did that was funny. I like uh, camping. Do you find that camping makes your love more intense? <laughs> or... <laughs> or do you just go with him to bring him down a peg or two? <laughs> Did you feel like you were getting away from your comedy roots a bit at this time? Yes, I, 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 when I look back, I do realise, and I, I, I know this for a fact, I did too many game shows. Mm. But you see, you could do them so quick and the money was fantastic. Was money often a decider for you? Was it hard to turn it down? Oh, yes, yeah. yes, because it was so, so quick, you see. You could do a whole series of 16 shows in two weeks. Yeah, go oh, nine, nine, a three. For each new series, a catchphrase or two were never far away. Don't touch the pack, we'll be right back. I've had loads of them. I mean, I'm in charge, started it. I've had nice to see you, to see you. Nice! And you do well! Good game, good game. All right, my love. What do points make? Right. It's another language, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but, they just, <laughs> but they just happen with me. And I, I, don't think you can, I don't think you can really make up a catchphrase. I think catchphrases just happen. Mm. You say something and the public make up their mind whether they're going to make anything of it or not. Do you ever get tired of hearing them? <laughs> That's a good question, actually. You can get a bit fed up with it, especially when you're out somewhere. I went to the cup final, and if I heard good game once... <laughs> I heard it a thousand times. Bruce, I hope you enjoy... Good game, good game! Life is the name of the game And I want to play the game with you
Although Bruce may have wanted to move away from game shows, he simply couldn't resist the lure of his old favourite when the Generation game had a reboot in 1990. Well, surely you should have put something on underneath. And I'm going to do everything dressing as well. It's probably one of the few shows that does cater fully for a, a family audience. Yeah. And very few shows can say that today. Yes. And I looked at a lot of the old clips and they still made me laugh. And I thought, well, if they make me laugh, mm. I think they'll probably make the public laugh again. Okay, now squeeze it, squeeze it. Go on. <laughs> I feel sorry for the poor thing. Bruce hosted the revamped Generation game on BBC One until 1994. Through the rest of the 90s, he continued to front shows on ITV, though after a fallout with the network over scheduling, it looked like his TV career was being phased out. But there was still one more twist left in the Forsyth saga. You can't expect your career to be all one big peak. I mean, you know, you'll learn. And... <laughs> <laughs> As the new millennium dawned, Bruce Forsyth was already more than 50 years into a stellar career with one of the most recognisable faces on TV. Actually, Bruce, people are always teasing you about your chin, but, I mean, yes. I, I have to say, I rather like it. I do. <laughs> I do. I think it's... That's I why I can't grow hair on my chest. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the shade. <laughs> However, as he reached his 70s, Bruce was spending more time on the golf course than on our screens. You she thought it was uphill? You did a golf. She'd well, always come the other way, I think. Well, uh, you know, well, uh, next time before you play, have an eye test. With retirement seemingly imminent, his career was unpredictably revived when he appeared as guest host on Have I Got News For You in 2003. My wife said, well, watch this, she said, Bruce, she said, you know, you could do that show. I said, I think you're right. I was just thinking the same thing. Why not? <laughs> so I phoned Paul Merton, who I'd met at a couple of uh, occasions. I said, how do you think I do on that? Have I got news for you? He said, well, he said, you've obviously got a bit of comic timing. I said, thank you. <laughs> Two or three days afterwards, that's when they called and said, would you do Have I Got News okay. For You? Play your Iraqi cards right. <laughs> Please. <laughs> This is satire. <laughs> a lot of people advised me not to do it. You were sticking your chin out with a chin like mine. <laughs> That's a dangerous thing to do. <laughs> now, these are the cards that the Americans made to show <laughs> all the Iraqi bad guys in the war. Now, Ian, you go first. Thank you, Bruce. It's the king of clubs. RCC vice chairman is at Ibram. Now then, it's a high card. <laughs> so, think about this. The audience will help you. Do you think it's high or lower? I'm not sure this program can go much lower. <laughs> oh, you haven't seen the finish yet. Just... <laughs> Bruce's triumphant turn opened the door to another opportunity, but this time, the big one, back in the heart of Saturday night. In the first place, when they first... It was called Celebrity Come Dancing. Right, right, that was right. the first name. And I thought, well, what a great idea. What, what a fun show. <laughs> Hello. Do you think you were the first choice presenter? Uh, who else? <laughs> I mean, who else could you possibly ask? <laughs> Natural turn fine, reverse turn, all on your balls. I think you did... <laughs> well, well there's just a minute. We, we all missed that, I tell yeah. you that. <laughs> I thought all the celebrities would come on, not be able to dance, and it would be like the Generation game. <laughs> be having fun with them afterwards. Were you dragging her off to be recycled? <laughs> But when these celebrities met the professional dancers and they started to get, after about two or three weeks, they got the competitive edge, and they got which the ballroom dancers always have. Yeah. I mean, when they get out on that ballroom, they want to win. And then the show got 
had a, something else about it that I didn't think it would have. Yeah, there's a real element there. Where so it's, it's were. turned into a giant. It's really grown beyond all means. By now, Bruce was into his seventh decade in showbiz, but he faced a whole new challenge, having to perform without the audience in his eyeline. Oh, you are, you are lucky. I mean, to have an audience right there. I talked to a dance floor. <laughs> It's very difficult, believe me. I found it the hardest thing I've ever done because I haven't got contact with the audience. And to me, contact is everything. They are your blood. A lot of people are impressed with Austin's muscles, especially that lady over there, evidently. But uh, he said to me today, Bruce, do you know I can lift my own body weight? I said, so can I. How do you think I get out of bed every morning? <laughs> Bruce combated these difficulties in his own inimitable style. I'll be standing on the side of the stage, you see, and they'll say my name, and I'll go... <laughs> <laughs> and I could never do that. <laughs> it's got to be... <laughs> <laughs> and when I do that little hop, uh, the other me turns up. What's the Bruce before the hop? N nervous and is it going to be all right, you know, because every show is a different show, different people, you never know what's going to happen. But then when I do that little hop and I walk on, the other Bruce is there. And what does that and Bruce thank say? God he turned up tonight. <laughs> <laughs> if he doesn't turn up, I tell you, that's when I know when it's time to pack it in. English tap dancing is all... Fortunately, the other Bruce has continued to turn up well into his 80s. It's carpet. I thought I'd gone deaf. <laughs> <laughs> he was knighted in 2011, and Sir Bruce even earned himself a place in the Book of Guinness World Records for his television longevity two years later. Tomorrow I might not even be able to get out of bed, but <laughs> right now, and when we first started this evening, I felt... 30 again. It's, yeah. it's, it's amazing that that happens, but it does because it's what performing yeah. is all about, how do you, you feel. Do you think you need it? Oh, yes, need... I, I need it. It's a part of me. Yeah, I need yeah. that Philip of uh, walking on and feeling good. And it if does. it's been a good night, if it's been a good show, then you feel great. Are you thinking in any way at all about, you know, retiring? Yes, tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you don't mean that. You don't mean that. No, I know one day I'm going to wake up and say, is it all worth it? Have I got the strength to do it all? But at the moment, I mean, this is what I love. This is what I grew up on in variety. And when I see this kind of a crowd, oh, I envy you. Oh, we envy you. Bruce announced his retirement from Strictly in April 2014, still very much at the top of the business, in an incredible career that has lasted more than 70 years. See the tapes of me when I first used to walk on at the Palladium with all these teeth and this awful... I could honestly say, I do hope I've improved as a performer because when I look at that guy that walked on in 1958, how he has lasted, I don't know. How do we sum up Bruce Forsyth? How do we just describe you? Well, the entertainer. I'm an entertainer. Daddy started out in San Francisco, tooting on his trumpet loud and mean. Suddenly a voice said, go forth, Daddy, spread the picture on a wider screen. The voice said, Daddy, there's a million pigeons ready to be hooked on new religions. Hit the road, Daddy, leave your common or wife. Spread the religion of the rhythm of life, and the rhythm of life is a powerful beat. A tingle in your fingers, down a tingle in your feet. Rhythm in your bedroom, rhythm in the street. The rhythm of life is a powerful beat. Let me hear it. Talk it to me. Nice to see you. I'm in charge. Did we do well? Ba 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 Julia! Oh, Julia! Oh, the rhythm! Great rhythm! Oh, the life! Yeah! And the rhythm of life is a powerful beat. A tingle in your fingers, down a tingle in your feet. Rhythm in your bedroom, rhythm in the street. The rhythm of life is a powerful beat. The rhythm of life to feel that powerful beat to feel that tingle in your fingers to feel that tingle in your feet 